Oh, what's up, you guys? Thank you for tuning in with Good Jones 610. I'm your driver, Chris FL. Uh, off to the left here, what we're looking at is a bunch of rubble. There was a warehouse there. It was an abandoned building that was been there forever. And it was just a massive fire that just took the whole thing out. So uh, I'm going to show you the news clip here. It looks the crazy. The reporter Alicia Reed joins us now from Marcus Hook with the latest. Alicia. Natasha, it's been 22 hours since firefighters first showed up to this scene, and that fire is under control, but they continue to put out hot spots at this hour. We're talking about a 233,000 square foot space that has been burning this entire time. Now, neighbors tell us they saw the fire erupt at the abandoned warehouse yesterday evening, and in no time, they saw a plume of thick white smoke bellowing into the sky. Shortly after, orange flames ravaged the building. Crews from Delaware and Chester counties and Newcastle, Delaware fought the flames from above. Now, people that live nearby at East 10th Street and Yates Avenue say the heat and flames were intense, even from hundreds of feet away. It did take until this morning to get the fire and smoke to simmer. I was at my daughter's house, and the fire was immense. But luckily, the fire. The wind was, it was, the wind was blowing towards the river because if it would have blew this way, it would have been another from the embers. It would have caught fire. The firemen had a heck of a time fighting this fire and maintaining it under control. The heat was so intense, you could feel it on your face, and it was like ready to melt the paint off the side of the house where my daughter lives. That's how close she was. Yo, shout out to that dude. That dude is the man right there. The news always gets the best people <laughs> to do the interviews. Injuries to report. So far, the cause of the blaze is still under investigation. Reporting live from Delaware County, Alicia Reed, CBS 3 Eyewitness News. So, something about the story, I think that news clip came out right after. But uh, they had actually found like four kids, four, four uh, minors hanging out around that warehouse. They, they never disclosed that they had any relation to it. But it sounds like there was a group of kids hanging out back there, like right before the fire broke out. So, uh, yeah, I guess, you know, you can do with that what you want. But mm, I guess because they were minors, they never really released what, what ended up happening with that. Here's another uh, crazy story right here. This isn't the exact location of where everything happened. Um, you got to go keep going straight down the street. And uh, it's, it's over there. But... Yeah, here's the story, man. This was crazy. Murder of an 18-year-old woman in Delaware County captured headlines in the early 1980s, but the case had gone cold until now. Here's Joe Holden with tonight's CBS 3 Mysteries. Denise Pearson never came home the night of April 14, 1981. The 18-year-old teen from Marcus Hook was last seen with a group of guys. Family, including Denise's mother, became deeply worried. She initially went with Peter Horn and others to Delaware, uh, where they, with the purpose of purchasing drugs. Remember the name Peter Horn. Prosecutors would later conclude Horn was a co-conspirator in her murder. Meanwhile, for Denise, she just wanted to get home. Investigators say over the hours, Denise Pearson developed a sixth sense, something telling her she should no longer be with this group of guys. But for her, it was already too late. She attempted to leave and was not allowed to leave. She was physically restrained from leaving. Inside a home owned by Peter Horn that was torn down years ago, Pearson was hit with an object and lost consciousness. She was tied up, placed in a wheelbarrow, and taken to the railroad tracks. She was then hit more times. A knife was used on her. She succumbed to those injuries. Pearson's remains were left there for years, her family believing she was missing the entire time. She had debris placed over her to somewhat hide her body. Kids playing along the tracks in 1984 discovered bones. Over the years, investigators made small strides in developing a case. Peter Horn was long front and center. He is now dead. Other men were also in the shadows of the case, including this man, Wayne Anthony Walker. A recent forensic analysis of that knife found with Pearson's remains was able to provide a huge break. Police say Walker was there when Denise Pearson was fatally slashed. It placed him as also being part of 
when she was actually murdered at the train tracks. District Attorney Jack Stolsteimer says Walker almost got away with murder, if not for that forensic scientist. She was able to take a look at the evidence and make a determination that this poor girl was still alive at the time she was taken to the train tracks, where she ultimately was left to rot. Her body was literally left out there. They didn't bury her. She stayed out there for three years before she was discovered. Walker was arrested earlier this month. It's unclear if he'll be competent to face clerk proceedings, but detectives are honing in on others. There are two other individuals out there. We know who they are. We are actively putting together evidence to try and charge them. For CBS 3 Mysteries, this is Joe Holden. So right here at this corner right here, uh, I think it was a building on the left, I'm not positive, but uh, right there, uh, that, that was the headquarters for the Pagans Motorcycle Club. Uh, that, so this, this whole town, Marcus Hook, was, was, Pagans pretty much ran this town. Every bar you went into, everywhere, Pagans, Pagans. Um, yeah, so I think after like a lot of uh, police crackdowns and, and, you know, law enforcement kind of tightening up on them, they, they had to lay low so they can't just like, you know, run around the town like they used to but yeah this this town used to be a straight pagan town man and so with that being said that'll lead us right into this next story all right so uh i wanted to share this story with you guys because this is a particularly kind of strange just a crazy story here so um what we're looking at here this is actually a really rare picture that's just very hard to find it's a wanted wanted poster that was put out by the uh fbi to bring in the president of the Pagan's Motorcycle Club. I don't know why they always call it a motorcycle gang. It's a motorcycle club. And uh, for, for Glenn J. Turner. Um, now, this story is crazy. So, th this is another one that, you know, they... So this is another story. I couldn't really find a lot, any videos or anything. So, I'm just going to go through the story with you guys. It's pretty crazy. So ex-gang leader to motorcycle club again um don't call him a, a gang but that's you know whatever so faces charges in cat deaths yes you heard that correct faces charges in cat deaths marcus hook glenn j turner is a convicted drug dealer an attempted cop killer who was once tagged as one of the most vicious and violent motorcycle club members in the country could it be that Turner, a former reputed vice, vice president of the Pagans, who was charged with Monday with killing uh, or maiming domestic animals, and the main, namely his son's two cats, was driven by his love for his ailing Doberman Pinscher? Nunya? <laughs> means Nunya business. I'm going to kill your fucking cats. For making my dog sick, Glenn Turner, 64, of the 800 block of Green Street, allegedly told his son, Clark, via a Nextel two-way with several witnesses in earshot, according to the charging documents. Additionally charged with burglary, criminal trespass, and tampering with evidence, Turner is free on 10% of $40,000 bail. Preliminary hearing is scheduled for October 25th. At the time the threat was allegedly made, Clark Turner was in the hospital visiting his wife, Donna. According to sources, Donna Turner was hospitalized soon after reportedly broke up a fight between her cats, but now missing, and the dog, which is believed to be in bad shape and under veterinary care. Some, so these cats, sound, <laughs> these cats sound pretty savage. Holy shit. Uh, so sometime late last week, according to sources, she let the dog into the house to stop its incessant barking. Glenn Turner often brought the dog when he worked in an unattached garage on the property. When Glenn arrived at the house, Glenn Turner was seen leaving the area in a vehicle, which was being driven by a white male in his mid-twenties wearing a black hat. An individual who met the officer on, on the porch said Glenn Turner and another male he did not know by the name, that he did not know by name, entered the house and killed two cats. The individual showed the officer areas around the house, which was marked in several areas with fresh blood, believed to be from the dead cats. When Clark, I'm sorry. When Clark Turner arrived at the house, the scene was secured. Detectives were notified. It was then that Clark Turner relayed the threat his father made against the felines. 
Clark Turner said he rushed home from the hospital after his father made the comment. Clark Turner identified the man with his father only by the nickname Knuckles, a member of the Pagans who he believes lives in Linwood. When police went to Glenn Turner's home, they found that he had recently showered. He was dressed in shorts and he had a damp towel on his head. Suspect didn't have much to say according to the affidavit. When an officer asked what happened at the son's house, Glenn Turner responded, I don't know what you're talking about. When the officer directly asked Glenn Turner if he killed the son's two cats, Glenn Turner responded, I'm on parole, man. No offense and no disrespect, but I don't know what you're talking about. Officer then told Glenn Turner he was seen leaving his son's home with another male. Well, so what if I was there? That's my son's house. I'm there a lot, he said. Turner then asked the officer, are we, are we talking man to man or are you going to write down everything that I say? Officer told Turner, it all depends on what you tell me. Famous last words, never fall for that. Never ask police, answer police's questions. They're just going to spin you and then, you know, charge you with whatever they're going to charge you with anyway. Glenn Turner countered, then I guess I have nothing more to say. My man. In 1983, Turner was sentenced to serve 25 years in prison in the shooting of New Jersey State Trooper John Jacobs during a traffic stop for speeding. His current parole status dates back to those charges as well as violations, petitions to dismiss other legal wranglings. So this dude was sentenced to serve 25 years in prison for shooting a state trooper. So what the hell is he, how is he on the street? And that's the end of the story. I mean, they kind of leave you here hanging, but... That is a weird story, you guys. That is a weird story. All right, let's get it. All right, so off to the right here at this Wawa, there was a shooting on uh, New Year's Eve this year. I haven't really been able to find any videos or YouTube videos about it. It's just kind of weird. Um, it seems almost like they're like trying to disappear the story or something. So uh, I got to report it to you guys myself, man. So uh, they had the two men charged in the connection to the fatal shooting. Uh, they were looking for them for a while, and, and I guess the information came out so the uh, police reports are very vague online. So the, the story that I understand basically is that these two men we're looking at here went to go buy weed off of somebody there in Linwood. Um, I guess the deal went south for whatever the case. So one of these guys is, is from Chester and one of them is from Wilmington, Delaware, which is right across the border, five minute drive. And uh, yeah, so these two guys were responsible for the shooting. I believe they got both of them in custody now. Um, let's see what it says. Oh, here goes the story. So the suspects in this case planned to steal a half pound of marijuana from the from the descendant. Um, from the so the suspects in this case planned to steal a half pound of marijuana from the decedent. Instead, one de individual is dead. A second grievously injured. And the two young sp suspects face a lifetime behind bars, says District Attorney Stolsteimer. The lives of four people and their families have been ruined forever over a half a pound of pot. That is crazy. A half pound of weed, man. I bet it was some mids, too. Or That's crazy, bro. Rest in peace to that young man that lost his life over there. It's, it's, it, it, for what it's worth, it's, it's very rare that something like this happens. This is the first time I heard of a shooting like this in Linwood for a long time. There was one like a couple years back. Uh, this was 
it might even be like 10 years ago, it was a while ago, where actually the neighborhood right behind this, this Wawa right here, uh, there was a fight uh, amongst a bunch of teenagers over there. And I guess one of the kids, he was 15 years old, and uh, I, I, I'm, it sounds like he lost the fight and he wasn't having it. Uh, he went and got his dad's gun. I believe it was dad's gun. He went in and got, took the gun and then just came outside and shot the kid in the back who uh, who he was fighting. So, but that was that was years and years ago. So it's pretty rare you see something this intense. But uh, yeah, these are just some crazy little stories I figured I'd share with you guys here. So we'll get back to the drive. All right, you guys. Well, thank you for taking this ride with me today. Um, thank you, everybody, who clicked that, that thumbnail and watched the video. If you like the content, please hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe for more. Uh, every like, every comment, it helps boost me in the algorithm, so it gets me out to a wider audience. So, yeah, as much as you guys can help me, I appreciate y'all. love y'all. I hope everybody out there is safe and healthy, and I'll see you on the next ride.